For we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means for expanding its sphere of influence, on infiltration instead of invasion, on subversion instead of elections, on intimidation instead of free choice, on guerrillas by night instead of armies by day. It is a system which has conscripted vast human and material resources into the building of a tightly knit, highly efficient machine that combines military, diplomatic, intelligence, economic, scientific, and political operations. Its preparations are concealed, not published. Its mistakes are buried, not headlined. Its dissenters are silenced, not praised. No expenditure is questioned, no rumor is printed, no secret is revealed. No president should fear public scrutiny of his program, for from that scrutiny comes understanding, and from that understanding comes support or opposition, and both are necessary. I am not asking your newspapers to support an administration, but I am asking your help in the tremendous task of informing and alerting the American people, for I have complete confidence and the response and dedication of our citizens whenever they are fully informed. The documentary that you are about to see is in response to the JFK speech that you just heard. It will be attempting to take on the tremendous task of fully informing and alerting the American people and the people of the world of this monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that JFK tried warning us about. And since there is much to cover in this documentary, let's dive right into it and not delay it with any further introductions or explanations. It's a great thing for history. George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, William Howard Taft, and President Barack Obama. What would you say if I told you he's related to all of those people? That you're wrong. Oh, no, I'm not. Let me take you through this, branch by branch. Vice President Dick Cheney, the man who's only a heartbeat away from the presidency, is actually a blood relation. He's President Bush's ninth cousin once removed. Cheney's cousin Barack Obama is also Bush's 11th cousin and the ninth cousin of Brad Pitt. But we're only just getting started. President Lincoln was President Bush's seventh cousin five times removed. And Bush shared more than just a ballot with John Kerry. That's right, they're ninth cousins twice removed. Bush. Really? What do you think of There's also royalty in the Bush bloodline. Princess Diana was Bush's 11th cousin twice removed. He's also related to Playboy founder Hugh Hefner, even Pocahontas, and Vlad the Impaler. Trace the family tree far enough, and you get Madonna, Celine Dion, and Tom Hanks. This is what I refer to as the world's greatest family tree. And this is only the leaves at the very top of the family tree. In this documentary, I'm going to seek to go down to the very roots of this family tree, to the primary root, and find out exactly where this family tree comes from, and precisely how long it's held positions of power. And to confirm that this wasn't fake news videos that you just saw, to confirm that this is a very real family tree, here are a couple other news articles that talk about it. One from NBC in 2004, one from the New York Times in 2008, and two of them as recently as 2015 and 2016, which claim that Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton are also related. And this was actually going to be the original purpose of this documentary. This documentary was originally a video called A Pessimistic Trump Prediction, 
And in that video, I was going to make a pessimistic prediction about Donald Trump's presidency based off of this information that he is related to Hillary Clinton. But then, before I knew it, I found myself in a rabbit hole that went all the way back to the beginning of civilization. But before I go dragging you back to the beginning of civilization, let's go over one or two more people that Donald Trump is related to. Like the Heinz Ketchup family. That's right, Donald Trump and the Heinz Ketchup family are related. And there was even an interesting film done about it, entitled Kings of Calistat. And the film is subtitled My Village, Ketchup, and the King of New York. Which is actually a proper title, because not only is Donald Trump and all of the presidents related to royalty on one side of his family, but on his other side of the family, on his mother's side of the family, Donald Trump can also trace his bloodline all the way back to Godred the Black King of Man and the Isles. And who is this Godred the Black King of Man and the Isles? Well, this Godred is our next clue. He's our next point down the world's greatest family tree. So the Black King can be found in Wikipedia under the name Godred Croven. And I'm just going to point out a couple of things about Godred Croven. I don't want to spend too much time on him because this documentary is going to be long enough as it is. So a few interesting things about Godred Croven. One, his precise parentage is uncertain. Although some believe that he is a probably a descendant of a king of Dublin. That's not very important. What is important is that Godred Croven actually wasn't a king. He actually violently seized the kingship from somebody else. Another interesting thing about Godred is Godred's greatest impact on history, which according to Wikipedia may have been his founding of the Croven dynasty. His descendants ruled the Isles for almost two centuries, and Godred was an important maternal ancestor of Clan Summerlee a family that held power in the Isles centuries after the final extinction of the Croven dynasty. So, right off the bat, it's very interesting to note that Godred's family, or at least his ancestors, controlled this area for centuries. Doesn't really say for how many centuries. His main family controlled it for two centuries, so that's almost 200 years. And then the family after that, which is still his family, it's just like his family who married off to another family and assumed another name. So they were in control for centuries after the final extinction of the Croven dynasty. It doesn't even say how many centuries. For centuries can be up to, up to today, but that's neither here or there. So the other interesting thing that it says about Godred here links him to these other possible names. It says that he could be this one guy who this one family claims is their ancestor. It also says that he could be identical to the celebrated King Ori of Manx legend. He could be this king that is talked about in a legend, and this king is traditionally credited with instituting the Manx legal system. Godred and King Ori are associated with numerous historic and prehistoric sites on Man and the Isles. And we're going to talk about some of those historic and prehistoric sites that they're associated with in one second. First, I just want to comment on this Manx legal system that he might be associated with, or he might be credited with. So this Manx legal system is essentially a legal system very similar to the English legal system of common law, and that's common law with a lowercase c, not an uppercase c. Going back to these prehistoric sites that he's related to, we're going to delay getting to them in one second because they're related to where Godred got his power from. And according to Wikipedia, Godred's power base may have been located in the Hebrides. Now, what are the Hebrides? I'm sure many of you are asking. Sounds a lot like Hebrews. Uh, maybe we'll connect those two later on. For now, let's talk about the Hebrides. The Hebrides are actually our next connection down the family tree. But we're not going to follow through with this connection. Let's just talk briefly about the Hebrides. So the Hebrides have an interesting history. These islands have a long history of occupation dating back to the Mesolithic period, around 6,500 BC. That's like 8,500 years ago. That's pretty far back, before ancient Egypt or around the establishing of ancient Egypt. Very important, because remember, this documentary will be going back to the beginning of civilization. 
So, the prehistory on this island, so it goes all the way back to 8,500 years ago. So there's an interesting thing on this archipelago. So there's a Bronze Age settlement on one of the southern the Hebrides, and it's the only place in the United Kingdom where prehistoric mummies have been found. That's right, prehistoric mummies. Mummies, as in ancient Egypt. Remember, we will be finding our way back to the beginning of civilization, to ancient Egypt and ancient Mesopotamia. These prehistoric mummies, they were found in Clyde Halen. These mummies are very interesting. A male who may have died around circa 1600 BC, and another, a female who died circa 1300 BC, about the same time as King Tutankhamun, or King Tut, of Egypt. Remember, ancient Egypt, we will be finding our way back there. Just not quite yet. So, there's some interesting things about these mummies. Some believe that they not only date back to the times of ancient Egypt, but some believe that they actually may have even been brought from ancient Egypt. These mummies are composed of different human remains, almost like they were uh, put together. It's almost as if uh, it was a human being who had gone through certain uh, organ doning or certain... Uh, it, it's, it's very odd, let's just say that. I advise people to go and read up on these mummies. So another thing can be found on this island, actually, and is the Kalanish stones. And these Kalanish stones are standing stones that are even older than Stonehenge. And it's, f it's funny because they're further north, too, so you would think that Stonehenge would have been built before them. Anyway, so these stones were prehistoric lunar observatory. Others have proposed a relationship between the stones, the moon, and the Cletium range on Harris. I, I, I didn't look up that, that range, to be honest with you. But th this is actually one of the prehistoric sites that Godred is related to. There's some mention of him on these stones. The only thing I want people to recognize is that it is a moon observatory, and that it's very old. And actually, there is one other interesting thing about these islands, and it comes from a legend, or actually it comes from a tale, and it was a tale about an expedition to the west coast of Scotland in, uh, shortly before AD 83. And this person stated it was a gloomy journey amongst uninhabited islands, but this person had visited one in which was the retreat of holy men. He mentioned neither the Druids nor the name of the island, and the Druids were the holy men in the area. So it's essentially a story of this guy who went in the direction of the Hebrides, where the Hebrides in this area, this moon observatory, should have been, and he mentions that it was a retreat of holy men. This is all going to be very important. And to further link the, the Hebrides and northern Scotland with ancient Egypt, I present to you this article entitled uh, Going Underground, The Massive European Network of Stone Age Tunnels That Weaves from Scotland to Turkey. And actually, these tunnels weave all the way down to Egypt, northern Africa. So it's just a very interesting article. Of course, the it's not one long tunnel. It's a, it's a series of tunnels that are somewhat intermeshed. You know, you can walk from one tunnel system to another, and you could theoretically do the whole journey going in and out of tunnels every uh, every so often. And it's interesting, these these tunnels, they're, they're very old, so it's very likely that other parts of this tunnel network have already collapsed, so it's very likely that this tunnel system was much more complex and uh, probably much longer or probably much more intermeshed than it is today. And essentially, I'm just presenting this because to me, it shows that there was some connection between Scotland and North Africa. There is a group of people using a hidden system of tunnels. And it's very interesting because uh, nobody really knows what these tunnels are for. They speculate that it was for bad weather, like traveling during bad weather. Some other people say it's, oh, it's to avoid like predators. I think that they're both wrong. If you look at this lady in the tunnel, one of the characteristics of this network of tunnels is that they're, it's very tight. There's only enough room to wiggle along, it says. And as you can see from this girl, this is a small female, there is not a lot of room to travel through these tunnels, okay? These are not tunnels for a lot of people to be traveling through when the weather's bad. And it's not used for people to travel to avoid predators. To me, they're secret tunnels. I believe that they're are meant to not arouse suspicion. 
they're tunnels that are designed in such a way that if other people who are not aware of, of what they are stumble across them, they won't be able to navigate them. Or at least they won't be able to easily navigate them. It'll deter people who are foreign to these tunnels or, or who are not wholly familiar with these tunnels. And more evidence to lend credence to my hypothesis that these tunnels are in fact secret tunnels can be found in the stories about these tunnels and the fact that churches and chapels were often built by the entrances of these tunnels. So in some cases there have been writings discovered that refer to these tunnels as gateways to the underworld. And apparently, according to this article, and I disagree with this, the churches and chapels were built at the entranceways of these tunnels, perhaps because the churches were afraid of the heathen legacy the tunnels might have represented. I think that these stories relating these tunnels to the underworld was a way to further deter people from these tunnels. And I think that this idea or this hypothesis that the church built their chapels and churches at the entrances of these tunnels because they were afraid of some heathen legacy also has some truth to it. However, I think that the truth that is hidden here is far from what they are trying to lead us to believe. I think that the church built chapels and churches by the entrances of these tunnels to further guard these tunnels. You can also prevent other people from constructing their homes around the entrances of these tunnels. And by perpetuating these ideas of uh, heathen myths or these heathen legends about these tunnels, which I'm sure the church is the one responsible for spreading, you also further deter people. Now let us return to Godred, for there is one more important point that I need to make about him. And that is this little interesting fact. The portrayal of Godred's takeover, in which a conqueror establishes his dynasty's dominance over the traditional rights of a native landholding populace, parallels the traditional medieval accounts of Harold Fairhair, who is remembered by medieval historians as the first king of Norway. See, this is very important, because he is noted as the first king of Norway, and guess what? He died around the exact same time as Godred, or at least around the exact same time that Godred was taking over. So this tells us that there were several kings being established in several different parts of Europe around the exact same time, and they behaved in almost the exact same way. Coincidence? I think not. Especially since we know that one of them got their power base from a very suspicious group of islands that appears to have relations with ancient Egypt. And not just relations with ancient Egypt, but also relations with the very suspicious and very far-reaching network of secretive tunnels, which predate all known civilizations. Before we travel any further down this rabbit hole, before we penetrate deeper into the roots of this world's greatest family tree, let us ask ourselves something. Let us ask ourselves, what could have created such a large and influential family tree? And let's try to remain within the realm of reason, within the realm of the knowns, historical knowns, historical facts. I don't want to hear somebody say, aliens created this family tree, because historically we cannot prove aliens. People can interpret stuff as being alien-like, but there is no direct evidence to prove aliens. There is only speculation and interpretation. So let us ask ourselves, what historical fact, what thing that is accepted by historians, can we use to explain the creation of such a large and influential family tree? This is the question that I asked myself at this part of my research. And the answer that I got was a very simple one. That answer being royal intermarriage. And of course, royal intermarriage being the practice of members of ruling dynasties marrying into other reigning families. And if you take a look over at Wikipedia, you'll see that royal intermarriage has been practiced in Africa, Asia, Europe, and throughout the Muslim world. However, an interesting thing missing here is it doesn't appear like there was such a thing as royal intermarriage in the Americas. 
and this is going to be an important detail later on in this video. But for now, let's just think about this practice of royal intermarriage, and let's ask ourselves another question. How long would it take royal intermarriage between these ruling dynasties before these ruling dynasties are all intermarried? Before these ruling dynasties are all wedded as one family? Now, we might not know the answer to that question. However, within this Wikipedia article about royal intermarriage, we find that as a result of dynastic intramarriage, all of Europe's 10 currently reigning hereditary monarchs since 1939 descend from one common ancestor. To me, this is really shocking. This makes the world's greatest family tree that we were looking at before an even greater family tree. Because it means that not only are all of these guys, all of these US presidents, related to Queen Elizabeth II, the Queen of England, but so are all of these guys. Is this just one massive coincidence that goes to show how small the world really is? Or does this fact reveal to us a grand and ancient conspiracy meant to keep power in the hands of a select minority? The answer to this question, of course, lies in the past, the present, and the future. Because after all, those who control the present control the past and those who control the past, control the future. We currently have a vague idea as to who is in control, which appears to be this royal family that is made up of many royal families. And we have dipped our toes into their past. But now, it is time to dive into their past. And our diving board is going to be none other than Queen Elizabeth II.